Saturday, everyone. This is your Saturday edition of Collider Mailbag. I'm Perry. This is Dennis, of course. Feeling pretty good. We got a long holiday weekend ahead of us. Yes, yes. It's solo came out, and we also have a nice three day weekend to to relax. Ooh, to to and relax probably we'll probably and watch movies and television shows. I thought most you were going to prioritize the food over the holiday weekend, uh, but you went with movies. Yeah, yeah food, food too. I mean, I can cook food at home while I watch. Okay. Watch things. At I will not be cooking. I could okay. be heating things in the microwave, though. You never know. <laughs> All right, we're going to jump into our five questions today. But as always, I need to remind you, YouTube isn't the only place to get your mailbag episode we are also on podcast as well under the movie talk feed so check that out tell everybody you know about it also if you want one of your questions answered right here on the show so many places to make that happen we do post on twitter facebook and instagram so all you have to do is reply to those use the hashtag collider mailbag so we can find it easily then also there's the email option mailbag at collider.com send those questions in short sweet you Unique, you know, all that good stuff. Let's get into our first one today now, and it comes from Twitter user Maddie Patty23. Maddie writes, Do you think studios slash executives are interfering with movies more than in the past? If so, why? I feel like there are too many cooks in the kitchen with competing tone slash visuals more often. It's frustrating to see only snapshots of good movies within whole films. What say you, Dennis? Yeah, I don't know if we are hearing it more because we have now the internet right because you know when mm-hmm. when i was younger and growing up we, we'd hear about movies but we'd only hear about them from like magazines and whatnot yeah. and even those magazines they're not really talking about the behind the scenes stuff and drama that that may be going on so i can't say whether or not it's happening more we're just hearing about it more but i, I i've noticed that i think executives have st- stayed away more from interfering during production and really the interference comes whether in pre-production and post-production compared to before um minus let's say solo yeah well solo and 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 well justice league was an example where they messed with it in the pre the during production and the post they did all three for justice league (laughs) um but yeah with with solo they, they they did but I don't know. I've noticed some filmmakers, especially, you know, you get more of the auteur ones like a Nolan or a Fincher or whatever, and they just kind of let them go and, mm-hmm. and do what they want, sometimes to the detriment, because then in, in, in post-production, like the movies are just way too long. Yeah. Uh, where my mind immediately went was what you brought up right at the beginning was maybe we're hearing more about it just because of the internet. And that does feel kind of inevitable too, because we're not just talking about, especially when you start moving into post-production, we're not just talking about any more test screenings and that giving some insight into what's working and what's not for audiences. Mm -hmm. Now we also have things like trailers coming into play where you're immediately bombarded with a ton of response to that trailer. Take New Mutants, for example, mm-hmm. where in that first trailer, they promised a horror movie. Everybody responded really, really strongly to it. And then that affected how they're editing the movie from there and what they're reshooting from there. So that could be one thing. Also, I do think that there actually might really be more interference. Mm-hmm. And if that is the case, I would tie it directly to the ballooning costs of movies and not even just a movie in and of itself. It's also the gigantic cost of a franchise or a cinematic universe and how that single movie could then affect that brand. Everybody needs to be involved in spending money like that and overseeing because we're also not even just having situations where it's like, oh, that writer writes sequel to said movie. We have writer's rooms where there's, you know, uh, I don't know, like five to 10 writers working on one cinematic universe. There's, there is, there's truth to it. There's so many cooks in the kitchen to use that saying. And I think it's just because these things are becoming cinematic franchise monsters. Yeah. And then when I say that, I think it's happening more in pre and post. Like if you take, for example, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, you have Kevin Feige, who's you know, has everything organized and planned out. And so during the scripting phase, you know, and this is why his changes, like, with you know, with Ant-Man, with Edgar Wright, mm-hmm. and even with Joss Whedon, who stayed on for Age of Ultron, but he did change certain elements because he wanted certain things to happen in other movies. Um, 
he I think he less messes around with what happens in production because he's already got it set like okay we this is the story we're telling and Marvel they, they've got a machine down right so like they know when they go into it there's no messing around and changing things here and there and then maybe in post they, they change up some stuff yeah there I think there's there's definitely a lot of truth to one this. thing <laughs> is I, I don't know how much it, it plays in and maybe I think it does though in, in Netflix so so Netflix movies and TV shows, mm-hmm. they allow tons of freedom. They once they they green light a concept and a budget and the, the like, whether it's a television series or a movie, they let the filmmakers go and do their thing, yeah. and then they come back and deliver. That's why so many showrunners and filmmakers love working with Netflix because they get to do what they want as long as they come within the budget, they deliver the n- amount of episodes they need to, and they deliver them on time, that's what Netflix cares about. It's going to be interesting to see if that changes for Netflix, too, especially with something like Bright getting mm-hmm. a sequel, if the franchise issue comes into play for them. And also, they're doing enormous movies now. We were just covering Six Underground, and I think the reported production budget on something like that is $150 million. You don't hire Michael Bay so that you could, you could have a whole bunch of people telling him what to do, but I do think they're going to, you know, they're they're essentially like the big studios mm-hmm. now where they are heading down that path and they're going to wind up running into some of those same challenges, especially if they're meant to compete with them while they're making these big franchises. And certain uh, certain streaming services are, let's say, acquiring the rights to gigantic comic book properties mm-hmm. that could essentially spawn a cinematic universe in the future. So it'll be interesting to see how Netflix changes over time. Yeah, uh, it's probably the golden age for for uh, filmmakers with Netflix right now. And then, like you said, once something big that they spend a lot of money on flops or doesn't do well, that's maybe when they will reassess and say, hey, maybe we could have fixed that and I changed guess that. so. They got a lot of money to spend yes. on original properties, though. Yeah, definitely. What's our next one? We've got from Facebook, uh, Christopher, uh, sorry if I mispronounced this, uh, Mangela writes, with Donald Glover rumored to play a villain in Black Panther 2, how do you feel about this casting since he already exists in the MCU and has appeared in Homecoming? Okay, first off with this one, that Metro report that claimed yes. that this was the case, they, they had also added that, that Killmonger could return mm-hmm. and you know, I, I pump the brakes with something like that. I don't want to say that they're just making stuff up, but you know, in any case where it's not coming from an, uh, an official studio statement, you always have to take these things with a grain of salt and think, this might not be true. Sure enough, um, Umberto yes. Gonzalez wound up taking to Twitter and he flat out wrote no truth whatsoever to what they said. On top of that, I found a CBR article and they apparently reached out to the studio and then Disney denied the rumor for them. So it doesn't seem like this is the case, but it does open the door to something kind of interesting, which is the idea of one actor having multiple roles in the MCU in a single franchise. And that led me down the rabbit hole of trying to find people mm-hmm. who have had two roles and I just came up with so many instances where it's happened before but it's like a James Gunn example a Sean Gunn example where he did some of the mocap for Rocket Raccoon mm-hmm. but then he played Kraken yeah, it's totally, always totally different it's you know? either something like that where the person isn't you know their face isn't front and center or it isn't kind of a, a big roller or at least not in the same capacity that these double Donald Glover roles would be in but then on top of that it's it's things like you know Clancy Brown and Alfred Woodard who have been on the Marvel Netflix shows and in the MCU, where there is that separation there, I think. Yeah, and then what you're talking about with uh, Sean Gunn, like Vin Diesel. Right now, he's only playing Groot, but mm-hmm. you could easily take Vin Diesel and make him That's another a good character. Uh, but, I, yeah, I don't know the, the truth of this. Usually we wait for either the studio or like a reliable source like Variety or the Hollywood Reporter. Uh, look, if they do bring Michael B. Jordan back as Killmonger, it definitely would have to be a flashback sequence. You couldn't, no. at least in my mind, you cannot bring back the character to life because then it defeats kind of the purpose of the first movie. As far as Donald Glover's character, his character is supposed to be um, 
What was his name? Aaron Davis. Prowler. Who's supposed to, yes, Prowler, who's also supposed to be Miles, Miles Morales' uncle, mm -hmm. and he's the one who actually helps, not helps, but accidentally mm -hmm. creates the new Spider-Man uh, because he steals tech from Oz, Ozcorp or whatever. And, it has and Prowler's part of uh, Into the Spider-Verse, the yeah. animated film that comes out in December, so I wonder if that would change what they want to do with uh, Donald Glover's role. Yeah, so I don't see one... It seems like not a good fit with Black Panther, uh, and I don't want to see Donald Glover play a different character other than the one he's already been cast in. Mm -hmm. And then it just seems like it fits more with Spider-Man. So if he does, if they do want to utilize him again, bring him back because they, you know, they showed him in the first Homecoming. Might as well. It must be some sort of foreshadowing for his character to come back in the second one or one third one. One would think, especially with his popularity mm -hmm. and his talent, more mm -hmm. important than anything. I think they would be lucky to have him in any capacity, but I, I don't think that there's much truth to this. Yeah, yeah. All right, we got another question. This one is coming from Andrew Kinsey via email. Andrew writes to us, Hey, would it really be so bad for Marvel to stop announcing their movie slates in advance? Imagine how much more impact Infinity War would have been if we didn't know they were making another Guardians, Black Panther, or Spider-Man. Imagine how much harder that Captain Marvel reveal would have hit. So yeah, clearly we've moved on from Infinity War spoilers. We're going to dive into it right now. If you haven't seen the movie, <laughs> we've talked about it a lot. I hope you have. It's a good movie. You yeah. should go see it. But we're, we're going uh, spoilers now. Yes. So so if you want to check out, please, please do so now. All right. What's your take on this one? My, my take is ideally, yes. Ideally for the fans, for the viewer watching, it'd be great to like not know that Spider-Man or Black Panther. Because I know when I was watching it and once it hit those characters, I'm like, okay, these people are coming back. There's no, they're, the movies are already announced. They're not throwing away uh, billions of dollars of money. Mm -hmm. um, but the reason why they have to do it and it's unavoidable is because they have investors. Disney has investors. They have investor phone calls, which a lot of actually breaking news comes out of those phone calls because yep. They have to, like Bob Iger, uh, all, he has to tell the investors, like, okay, this is on our slate. We're, we're coming out with these movies because he needs to instill confidence in these investors and also whether they want to invest more money or there just needs to be an overall you know, good feeling about the direction of the company. So they always have to announce these things ahead of time. So, yes, as fans, it would be kind of cool and the impact would be more, but... I think it's something you can't avoid, but yeah. but younger kids though, because I, I talked to someone and like their younger kid that watched it, they don't know about any of this business stuff, and they were like crying and yeah. they were so impacted by the movie because they don't have no idea, they don't know Spider Man slated to come out next year. So I think it's one of those things where. I, for us, like, older people that know about the business, yeah, it's less impactful. Yeah, I mean, the investor thing is a very good point to bring up. And on top of that, I mean, look at the question we just covered before. This stuff leaks. It doesn't matter how good your security is. Someone hears something, they report mm -hmm. it. It's kind of just the nature of the business. As much of a bummer as that could be when it comes to spoiling things before a filmmaker or a studio intends for it to be revealed. But it is an interesting thing. And, you know, I have this on my mind more so than ever in this gap between Infinity War and Avengers 4, not even just with announcing what's on your slate, but with every little bit we see, whether it's something that's in a full feature, some sort of promo for an upcoming movie. I mean, with what they did in Infinity War, they gave themselves what seems like a pretty close to impossible challenge to me. And I'm just, I'm so curious to see what kind of creative opportunities they wind up finding trying to market these things because suspense and not knowing is important. And yeah, so one thing that I think st uh, speaks to how good Infinity War was and how well executed that last sequence was, was while I was watching it, it was, even though clearly we're well aware yes. of what's coming, I was stressed to the max as that was playing <laughs> out. And even as the credits rolled the first time that I saw it, I think I was just so emotionally overwhelmed by it that it took me a couple minutes to sit there and be like, chill out, mm -hmm. we know what's coming next. Yeah. But it, it just speaks to how well I think that played in context. But the other thing that, that's crossing my mind right now with some of this is a lot of people have been talking about a fork, like a fork in the MCU uh -huh. where 
it, it could diverge into into two paths mm -hmm. where everybody who is blown away into dust winds up existing in one parallel mm -hmm. universe and then we're left with the Avengers in another one. It's an interesting concept to consider. I don't think that's what they're going to do at all, mm -hmm. but that's something that, that I've been having fun kind of playing around imagining. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and I, for me, it's, it's also the execution, even knowing, you know, we're talking about spoilers here, knowing uh, Spider-Man will be back. That ending still affects me, even yeah. the second time watching it, because of the performances, the execution, the direction. You have Tom Holland's performance. He's so good yeah. in that scene. So that, so good. that, 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 even knowing that, and that makes, you know, what makes a, a good movie, because there's a lot of movies you've seen before that you know what the ending is. You know the good guy's going to win, right? Yeah. But it still affects you. It's still There's still tension and drama. You know what's going to happen, yet you still feel the same feet feelings as yeah, before. I've been talking about that recently for some reason where there's so many movies that are based on true stories that I'm well aware of, but if the movie is done well, you could still feel the suspense and tension leading up to the end that you know is coming. Yeah. Definitely. All right. Want to hit number four now? Yeah. We've got on uh, from email. Matthew Evans writes, hello, love watching the show. I want to know in your opinion, what is a really great idea slash concept that was in a bad or lackluster movie? A few examples I can think of while the idea of people committing mass suicide is original unsettling and creeping and pairing it with killer plants in the happening was terrible also the belko experiment had a great idea but it had underdeveloped characters and turned into a shouting match without offering any social commentary about our society that makes it for every man for himself thank you and keep up the great work well i'll echo that i think the uh the belco experiment was a really interesting idea and that movie didn't work very well for mm -hmm. me either where it was almost like when when you watch a movie like that or at least from my perspective i can't speak for everybody but when i went into that movie i wanted something that was that was almost like a fun gory wild ride but also did actually say something and what i got was a movie that didn't say all that much and also it, like it it bummed me out mm -hmm. it made made me feel bad. I didn't enjoy watching it either. Um, and with the happening, you know what TV show on Netflix did a great job with like a killer natural mm -hmm. element. It's The Rain. Have oh. you heard of The Rain? I've heard of it. You I have it on my watch. queue, but I haven't watched it. It's Nobody's like listening to me in this office. Yeah. Everybody <laughs> needs to watch The Rain. The Rain has a virus that, that is carried mm -hmm. by The Rain and it kills a mm -hmm. significant part of the population. So if The Happening didn't do it for you, try The Rain. The Purge is always something I will uh, bring up when I'm answering a question like this because I I do really like the first Purge. I like that, not the first Purge movie coming out. I mean the first Purge movie. I liked that movie a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, even though it wasn't exactly what I was anticipating, I did like the home invasion spin on it. Then Purge Anarchy, I had a lot of fun with. Purge election year, no, no. But even when I considered the two movies I did like, there's always been more to that idea to me mm -hmm. that I don't think any of the movies have really tapped into as much as they could have. Who knows? Maybe the first Purge, which is coming out this summer, will finally do it. But I will wait and see. The other great example I have for this, because I was so excited for this movie based on the concept, was do you remember In Time? Yes. With Justin Timberlake and Amanda Seyfried? That idea of you stop aging at 25 and then... Uh, time becomes currency. Mm. That is genius to me. And that movie, that plot just went so off the rails. It was like a great first act, and then I didn't care. That was the one Justin Timberlake starred yes. in, right? I did not watch that. I know, I, I can't remember who directed, but I know uh, Roger Deakins shot it. Did it he was, really yeah, shoot that? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah. So uh, I actually have Purge on my list as well. Uh, the first movie I saw, I really liked the concept of it. I felt like the execution of it wasn't what I expected. I thought mm -hmm. it was going to hit me a lot more. And so I thought that was a concept that was really cool that could have been done yeah. better. Um, Van Helsing is one that it's a terrible a, movie, yeah. but it's a cool concept, right? Like a guy who's basically is hunting down all these supernatural monsters. That's a cool idea. Just unfortunately, the movie wasn't very good. Yeah, I, I could agree with that one. Uh, Andrew Nichol directed and okay. wrote in time. Uh, 
One more that I'll throw in there because I'm still obsessed with the first one and then all the others went straight to a DVD was Death Race. <laughs> Death Race is such a genius concept. I love that first movie. I have a lot of fun with it, but I want more Death Race. I feel like they could have done more with that franchise beyond just, you know, straight to DVD type sequels. Are you talking about the the, the remake? The remake, yes. The remake the with remake. Jason Statham, yes. right? Okay. I have seen the original okay. actually, but the remake is the one that I have a habit of watching on okay. repeat more than I care to admit. <laughs> All right, we've got one more question here today. This is our Instagram question, and it comes from Ice Shinobi 93 mm. who writes, "Thank you Collider for everything you do. I watch you every day. If you can create your perfect movie theater, what would you put in there?" So, I obviously chose this for yes. a reason. This yeah. is my favorite question. I, yes. I think I told the reason why somewhere, but yes. oh, I, oh n never mind. I'm not going to spoil anything. Okay. Yeah, uh, this is my favorite question because it's like the fantasy wish, you know, you want to think about what you could do. Definitely for my perfect movie theater, it would be attached to my house. It would okay. be a private movie theater that was, I custom built that was part of my house so that I could go and watch uh, there anytime. Obviously, it'd be a huge screen that was, you know, a 4K projector, which, you know, would, could be easily upgraded as technology moved on, have a uh, Dolby Cinema sound yep. in there, 20 to 30 recliner so, uh, seats. Okay. So that's, that friends can come over. It's a fair amount. So it's, it's, it's not too many, but it's like enough where if you bring friends over. Yeah. Um, definitely those, those things could recline. They'd have cup holders. They'd have places to put food and snacks and super comfortable and then also have like on it'd be like a stadium seating obviously and then at the top would be like a bar like a bar so that there's like stools that people can sit there drink their alcoholic beverage or non-alcoholic <laughs> beverage eat snacks and watch the movie as well there'd be a popcorn machine there'd be you know a refrigerator with tons of drinks um also this would be a place not just for movies it'd be a place i'd watch tv right like something like game of thrones and have friends over and be like hey guys that idea i like think about how many people would come over to your place to watch game of thrones and watch i didn't it all think together. about that you're making me want to change my lineup a little <laughs> can i can i steal that idea and sure. make my i want mine to be a movie and a tv theater too but yeah I would have less seats. I feel okay. like 30, you're risking that one jerk to come in with a cell phone or something. If it's just uh, 10, okay. I feel like that limits it to the important people mm -hmm. that I okay. trust. But going down my checklist here, so Dewey is allowed in. Okay. Dewey is allowed in, of course. Obviously, I need the best uh, projection system and the best sound system. For food, I'm very into acai bowls and frozen <laughs> yogurt. There could be other things for people with different tastes, but th those are two things that I want on the board. Because okay. like, seriously, one of my favorite things to do on like a rainy Sunday afternoon is sitting on the couch with Dewey with like a freaking enormous thing of frozen yogurt. Mm -hmm. Frozen yogurt's awesome. Um, then also I need three trailers to play before the movie because even though it, you know, it's nice to go in and just have the movie start right off the bat, I really enjoy a good trailer mm -hmm. on the big screen because it is a completely different experience when you watch something on your tiny laptop mm -hmm. screen and then you see it projected. But the problem I have with trailers right now is that I mean, there's just too many. I can't believe that I sit there for something like 20 to 30 minutes before a movie starts mm -hmm. watching something like eight trailers. No, give me three. Cut it off there. Arclight does three. Arclight is only just three. Yeah. Does it really? Yeah. I don't know the last time I've been to a public screening uh, at the Arclight. Yeah. I just went to a screening in New York back home. I saw the movie The Rider, mm -hmm. and it was in a small theater, and they had all these, like, I mean, super small independent movies, but they st and I, those are trailers I wanted to see, but they, they must have played, like, eight to ten of them. And yeah, I was, yeah. I, I think, was losing uh, my mind. Before AMC screening, or not screens, but showings, there's, like, 20 minutes of trailers so but Arclight is three they do three okay then, okay maybe I should go to Arclight more often yeah. um one more rule no phones no phones no phones you just you check them at the door and you just wait like why why do you even need your phone on you yeah <laughs> see for mine it'd be like it depends on what we're watching at my home theater if it's a movie yeah you get to you can't pull out your phone but 
if you're watching, and even Game of Thrones, you can't either. But like, if uh, I was hosting some, like watching like UFC at my no. place or whatever, you know oh, what I mean? Well, like, that's different. Like, like that's a sporting different. event or okay. something like that, where it's not, you know, okay. that that important. Sporting event can have the exception. Yeah, I, if you want to watch the Super Bowl or something, you know, you can't tell people not to use their phone watching the Super Bowl. If it's a TV or movie where like the lights are out, I can't stand when someone tries to like hide it uh, in like down the row. I'm always that person that's too afraid to oh, actually I, say turn your phone off or something. So I'll do the dramatic. Like, so uh, they can know that I'm looking at I, them, I do the tent. Which I, I do the tent, though. Like, if I have to have to use yeah. the phone, if I, I'm like... What's expect, the tent? I, oh, I like shirt? build... Yeah, like, I build, like, a tent and a jacket, and I'm, like, underneath, and it's down, you know, like... And then I'm like <laughs> I can't wait until yeah, I yeah. go to a screening and I catch Dennis uh, yeah. looking down his shirt to see his phone. So I'm, I'm very... You know, I don't want to bother anyone else. So I like I pick a part of the movie that's already bright, right? You you're not gonna do that during a dark scene, right? You wait till it's already bright, and then you take out your phone and then build a little a little tent. <laughs> the bread baker from Themyscira uses yes. a tent so he can check his phone yes. during movies because so. he's very conscious of other people <laughs> and not not trying to bother them. <laughs> That's so kind of you. Yes, I'm not, I'm not playing mobile games on my phone. I I, I can't still can't believe that that actually happened. There was a guy, when I was watching uh, San Andreas, the guy next to me was playing a mobile uh, phone game the whole time. <laughs> the whole time he's like playing. It's crazy. Like he paid money and it, it wasn't a cheap theater. It was in the Dolby, uh, the, the AMC Prime. Yeah. Paid money, good money, like $20 to watch a movie. Didn't watch the movie. It was just in the back row on his phone. I almost wish that I could have been there for something like that. So after I could, you know, calmly go up to the guy and say, you know, listen, I'm, ju I'm just curious. What? Why? Like, why did you choose to do that? Yeah. I don't know. All right. <laughs> well, Baffles it. me. Baffles me. That's all we have for you guys today. Again, thank you so much for watching. Another reminder, use email, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to send in your questions for next weekend shows. Hope you guys enjoy this long holiday weekend. Please like and share this video. And also, tune in for uh, Sunday. Sunday about to mailbag. Say Monday. I'm moving on to the end of the holiday already. We're not there yet. Sunday mailbag tomorrow morning. Check it out. We'll see you soon. Hey everybody, Mark Ellis here. Thanks for watching this episode. You want to watch more? Then click up here. Or you can click right here for more great content from Collider. If you haven't subscribed to Collider Video, do so right now and share this vid with your friends. Thanks for watching.